Friedman enjoyed a friendly relationship with Nixon. Several of his Chicago school colleagues and disciples were recruited to work for the government. Donald Rumsfeld was one of them. Congratulations. But in 1971, with the economy in a slump, Nixon turned his back on Friedman's ideas and imposed a wage and price control policy. He put Rumsfeld in charge. Which is essentially a problem of supply and demand. I have for long been opposed to the wage and price control. I believe it involves government intervention with the freedom of individuals. I think it's intolerable. The Keynesian policy was a success and Nixon won a second term with a landslide majority. It was a blow for Friedman. Then in 1979, Margaret Thatcher was elected Prime Minister of Britain. Her intellectual guru was Milton Friedman's old mentor, Friedrich von Hayek. And just over a year later, Ronald Reagan was elected President of the United States. Both Britain and America were now ruled by unabashed Freemanites. Margaret Thatcher's program when she came in had four planks. Cut government spending, cut tax rates, reduce government ownership and operation of industries or regulation of industry, and have a moderate and stable monetary policy to bring down inflation. Within her first three years in office, unemployment doubled in parts of the economy, leading to waves of strikes. Thatcher's personal approval rating slumped to 25 percent. There were riots in Britain's major cities. Even Margaret Thatcher's admirers had their doubts. The economic performance of the Thatcher government has been mixed. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies not for turning. <laughs> Friedrich von Hayek urged Thatcher to copy Pinochet's economic shock therapy policies. Thatcher replied, in Britain, with our democratic institutions and with the need for a high degree of consent, some of the measures adopted in Chile are quite unacceptable. Thatcher's profound unpopularity seemed to be proving once again that free market fundamentalism was simply too unpopular, too directly harmful to too many people to survive in a democratic state where governing requires getting the consent of the governed unlike a military dictatorship. What pulled Thatcher back from the abyss and ultimately saved the project was a crisis. Indeed, it was the ultimate crisis. It was a war. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. The government has now decided that a large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are complete. HMS Invincible will be in the lead. Most people in Britain had never even heard of the Falklands. But when Argentina invaded a small group of islands thousands of miles away in the South Atlantic, Thatcher seized her opportunity to prove her credentials as the Iron Lady. Gentlemen, I've just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. <laughs> The war was over in less than three months. As the troops returned to Britain, a wave of patriotic celebrations swept the country. Thatcher won the 1983 elections with a massive majority. She could now push through a form of the economic shock therapy witnessed in Chile. The most powerful union in Britain was the National Union of Mine Workers. When the National Coal Board tried to close pits down, the miners went on strike. Parts 
of central London are brought to a halt as thousands of miners and sympathizers march through the city in support of the miners' strike. It's Britain's longest and most bitter since 1926, and the most expensive ever. The strike lasted almost a year. Thatcher used every means at her disposal to destroy the union. Eventually, the miners were defeated. Thatcher used this victory to bring the Chicago School Revolution to Britain. A series of glossy commercials promoted a massive program of privatizations. Thatcher sold off the steel industry, water, electricity, gas, telephones, airlines, oil. Public housing was sold off. Council services put out a tender. In 1986, financial and banking services were deregulated. It was called the Big Bang. No one here tonight needs reminding that the Big Bang is only a beginning. In Britain, before Thatcher, a CEO earned ten times as much as the average worker. By 2007, they earned more than a hundred times as much. In the US before Reagan, CEOs earned 43 times as much as the average worker. By 2005, they earned more than 400 times as much. Friedman openly acknowledged the importance of Thatcher and Reagan in the spreading of Chicago school policies around the world. The coincidence of Thatcher and Reagan having been in office at the same time was enormously important for the public acceptance worldwide of a different approach to economic and monetary policy. What I'm describing now is a plan and a hope for the long term. The march of freedom and democracy which will leave Marxism-Leninism on the ash heap of history as it has left other tyrannies which stifle the freedom and muzzle the self-expression of the people. Now we all know the fairy tale about the fall of communism that the West under Reagan and Thatcher looked so prosperous to the people of the former communist bloc that they themselves demanded radical free market policies. Now this really is a fairy tale. It is true that people who had been living under authoritarian communism genuinely wanted democracy. And it's also true that people wanted to be able to go out and buy blue jeans and have Big Macs, that is true. But that does not mean that they wanted the kind of Wild West capitalism of oligarchs gone mad and no social protections that so many Eastern Bloc countries actually ended up with and suffer under to this day. Thatcher had done everything she could to break the power of the unions in Britain, but in 1988, she went to Poland to show her support for the workers' union Solidarity. Strikes in Poland led to Solidarity being allowed to contest the general election in June 1989. This triggered a wave of demonstrations throughout Eastern Europe. In the past, the Soviet Union had used military force to crush democratic movements. But the Soviet Union had a new type of leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was committed to glasnost and perestroika. He talked about a third way, a gradual transition to Scandinavian-style social democracy, something between free market capitalism and communism. <laughs> 